Science may seem like a members-only club for experts and academics, but recent efforts are opening the field to anyone who's interested. Here to tell us how ordinary citizens are helping find extraordinary data is Darlene Cavalier, founder of SciStarter, a crowdsourcing site for science research. Now, some people have heard of Kickstarter and trying to get money from strangers to fund your idea, but SciStarter is not asking for money, more time. Time and talents, exactly right. We have over a thousand opportunities in SciStarter. These are where researchers or anybody who has a curiosity um, and wants to work with a crowd to gather evidence mm -hmm. um, can post their opportunities on SciStarter. And then we help people find those opportunities to donate their time and talents. I don't have a science background. and oh, What kind of things can I help in? It is unbelievably broad. Um, if you're a bird watcher, there are a ton of projects for you to get involved in. Um, if you're a concerned citizen, um, I mean, the Flint, Michigan episode is a great example of how a researcher from Virginia Tech University provided funding and technical expertise, but needed people in Flint, Michigan to provide data to him. Um, and that is basically a crowdsourcing project. Um, we have online crowdsourcing projects where you can do this from the comfort of your home. 2 a.m. in the morning, if you feel like clicking through some images, you can help scientists identify neural networks of a brain. Um, and fun things too, just getting to know the personality of your dog and at the same time contributing to re canine research too. What are humans able to do that now you'd think computers can solve that? What, what, why are humans necessary? Uh, well, first of all, identifying anomalies um, is, is one major thing. So we have a, a new project that's forthcoming called We Cure ALZ. And so when I say we, I mean that SciStarter helps make the connection, but it's not our project. And so this is Pietro Michelucci, um, who's a cognitive scientist who's looking to hopefully cure Alzheimer's someday. He's combining two platforms that are very complicated, and yet I'm going to try to boil this down. One is called Stardust at Home. Mm -hmm. So this is a popular citizen science project that takes a million images of stardust um, that was collected um, when a satellite through, flew through the tail of a comet. Okay. So microscopic Stardust. So it's an online virtual um, microscope. So people can sort through these images and they know what to look for. They're instructed on what to look for there. Combines that with a platform called iWire, which is a very popular mm -hmm. citizen science project, another online citizen science project that uses the power of the crowds to start to identify um, the neural network of the brain. So uh, Dr. Um, Michelucci is putting these two platforms together to help people start to identify blood flow in vessels and where it's being basically clogged mm -hmm. and to look at microscopic evidence of where those clogs are happening as a first step. That can't be done with computers right now. So, and there's even a project that was looking at basically the cure to cancer. Yes, this is from um, Cancer Research UK and they actually have a number of projects along those lines, but one was, was done as a test at first. It was called Cell Slider. So for the testing part of it, they took some um, slides of uh, tumor images. They put them online with clear instructions uh, to help people understand what a, what a tumor looks like, a cancerous tumor looks like, what a healthy cell looks like. Um, and this was uh, organized through a, another popular platform called Zooniverse. So people were able to click through images to look for healthy and unhealthy images. Um, so what those researchers were doing was really trying to get a sense of, can people be accurate about this? Can we right. really put this out to the crowds? They're kind of skeptical. They wanted to see two things, the level of accuracy and the amount of time saved. Why not just have their professional researchers sure. continue to do this? So for that particular project, they were able to quantify every bit as accurate as their professional researchers and half the time. And because of that, they've invested some time and money in their own platform to roll out much larger crowdsourcing efforts. Uh, the example I used earlier with We Cure ALZ, they expect that to cut down by in the hundreds. So really speed this um, rapid pace of discovery. But then we're seeing more and more projects where the definition of who the expert is can be called into question. The expert could be somebody who is local, who is uh, very knowledgeable about their own situation, take a fisherman or, or a farmer. They probably know their own situation better than anybody and can start to notice changes in, in climate, um, changes in the fact that their fish aren't showing up as mm -hmm. they had before, or they mm -hmm. look deformed, or something's different here. More and more projects are being initiated by individuals who are curious and who need help from the public 
to start to gather evidence. What starts to happen then is, in order for that evidence to be taken seriously, legitimized, and used by people who are in positions to make decisions, we start to look at other barriers to entry for people, which include um, you know, good scientific method that's described articulately to people, so they feel their time is being valued if they get involved in this project, so that they can begin to understand the outcomes of what happens with my data if I share this. And I can't say that always happens with the professional research projects too. Yeah. Sometimes we wonder what happens with that data. Yeah. Um, and then also access to tools, tools that um, give valid data that can be calibrated and that are accessible to people. This is where we start to see the do-it-yourself movement. It's an exciting new, I would say, emerging area of citizen yeah. science is this um, mashing up of the maker movement and the citizen scientist coming together to kind of t take down some of those barriers that we've seen before. Where do you see citizen science going five years from now, ten years from now, if we have this conversation? Uh, is it going to be some sort of large-scale breakthrough that was brought on because of citizen science? No doubt. And again, we've already started seeing those mm -hmm. large-scale breakthroughs that are brought on because of citizen science. What I would like to see happen, and this is something we're, we're starting to test out with um, Arizona State University and the School for the Future of Innovation and Society, is the ability to start to help formalize, if, if the volunteers are interested in this path, how do we start helping to give them formal credit for what they're doing? Mm -hmm. They're advancing areas of research for which, by and large, the researchers involved in that are you know, rising through the ranks of their profession. They're getting their papers published, and they're, they're getting their promotions, and they're heading towards their, their tenured position, and that's, that's all well and good. And we're solving problems in the, in the interim, which is very exciting. But what about these people? When you ask me about the demographics, when we meet people involved in these projects, I'm surprised at how many did not go to college. When I bring up that issue and the example of the farmer and the fisherman, they may not have formal education. For whatever reason, they chose a different path. Um, or they may be somebody like me. I didn't study science in college. Mm -hmm. I was a late bloomer to my interest in, in science. And so when I came back out and said, I like science, I'd like to connect in a more meaningful way. I couldn't find the opportunities. I, couldn't, I didn't know where the on-ramps were. That's why I started SciStarter, mm -hmm. to say, hey, everybody, science degree or not, come, there's something for you, and you're very much valued, and you're really needed for these projects. Darlene Cavalier of SciStarter, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me.